Good morning. I told you guys we were going to bring back some of those old hymns. There's some of them that should never be forgotten. And uh, it was beautiful, wasn't it? How many of you ever heard that song before, that last one? Anybody heard it? Yeah. Yeah, it was a good song. So good stuff. Good to see you guys today. Hey, uh, we're in a series called This Is My Bible, and we're going from Genesis to Revelation, January to December, a different book. Every single week when you walked in, you should have received one of these as an overview. You can also download our New Hope Eastlake app, and it has all that information on there, the message notes, these uh, Bible map things that we have, these overviews, those are on there. This is my Bible.io has tons of resources. It has all of the messages, Genesis through what it judges today. Um, it has devotionals from our staff. It has our, our uh, Bible in a year reading plan. It has all of these, all the message notes. So go to this is my Bible.io and you can get all of the information or you can catch up to where we're at. A different book every week. Have you guys enjoyed the series so far? You guys enjoying it? Hey, there's a lot of people watching online. Thank you for joining us. I've been getting emails and letters from people online, so thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I've been asking you to do a few things. One, I've been asking you to bring your Bible to church every Sunday. You've been doing a great job at that. I've been asking you to read the Bible every single day. Every day, even if it's one verse, just read the Bible every day. And then for a lot of you, you've been reading through the Bible in a year. I thought it would just be a few of you, but there's a lot of you that are reading the Bible through in a year. So that's amazing. I'm really excited about that and really proud of you guys uh, for doing that. Today, we are going to be in the book of Judges. The book of Judges. So we've been Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and now we are going to be in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is a dark book. It really is. And a lot of it's R-rated. So if you like R-rated content, read your Bible. <laughs> read the book of Judges. Um, historians tell us that throughout the history of time, Great civilizations typically last about 200 years, give or take. It's almost without exception that each civilization goes through nearly an identical cycle. And I've put that cycle in your notes and you see it. It begins with bondage and it ends with bondage. Almost without exception, great civilizations throughout the history of our world have gone through this cycle from bondage to spiritual faith, spiritual faith to great courage, great courage to liberty, then to abundance, then to leisure, selfishness, complacency, apathy, dependence, weakness, and then back to bondage once again. And you say, well, why in the world does that happen? Well, depravity, sin. That's why this thing just happens over and over. This cycle never ends. It's interesting to think, where are we as a country in that cycle? Interesting. We see this cycle in the book of Judges repeated over and over and over again. The book of Judges can be a pretty depressing book. It can be a very frustrating book because remember, the people of God have taken the promised land and this is supposed to be the greatest thing for them. This is supposed to be a very liberating, free thing for them and yet it ends up being the cycle of bondage even in their own land. Um, and we see this same cycle repeat itself. Remember at the end of Joshua, Joshua had made kind of this ultimatum. And he told them, he said, hey, there are a lot of false gods in this land because they were to drive out the inhabitants of, of the promised land. They didn't do everything God told them to do. And so Joshua made this statement at the end of the book of Joshua, who are you gonna serve? Are you gonna serve false gods? Or are you going to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And then, of course, Joshua makes this incredible declaration, me and my house, we're going to serve 
the Lord. My family, we're gonna serve the Lord. Now this isn't in your notes, but you can write it down because it's really important. In Joshua chapter 24, in verse 31, it says this, the people of Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him. So that sounds good, right? They served the Lord through Joshua's lifetime and the elders who outlived Joshua, those who had personally experienced all that the Lord had done for Israel. But then we get to the book of Judges and you can mark chapter two, verse 10 in your Bible because we see the stark contrast of them living for the Lord. And then in Judges, it says, after that generation died, which generation? That generation that we just spoke of at the end of Joshua. Another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that God had done for Israel. It's important for us to never forget God's blessings. It's important for us every day to be thankful for the things that God has provided. The Israelites had forgotten what God had done for them, what he had brought them out of. And as a result, they did not even acknowledge the Lord or the mighty things that he had done. Then in verse 11, it says, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. And they went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them and they angered the Lord. So this is how this book begins, them angering the Lord. They had forgotten about God, they had started serving false gods and that angered the Lord. So we're gonna look at the historical content of Judges. We're gonna look at some key events, which basically we're gonna run through the entire book in an expedited way. And then we're gonna come back to ordinary people that were used in extraordinary ways. And we're gonna highlight three people from this book that were ordinary people that God used in tremendous ways. And so historical content. The book of Judges is most likely written by Samuel. And I'm not gonna talk to you a lot about Samuel because we'll talk about him. He has a book that bears his name, first and second, Samuel. Samuel was the last judge of Israel. A common theme in this book, and this is all in your notes, is failure after failure through compromise. We see this over and over again, that the Israelites would compromise, and as a result, um, they would be captured or they'd be overtaken by enemy forces. Now, when we think of a judge, what do you think of? When you think of judge, what do you think of? I mean, this is who I think of right here. That's who I think of, yes. You know it's gonna be a great sermon when Judge Judy's up on the screen, right? Anytime I can use Judge Judy in a sermon illustration, it's a good sermon. I love Judge Judy, man. She don't put up with nothing. You're a bum, get a job and take care of your family. I love that. She's, she's awesome, man. I, I love Judge Judy. So when you think of a judge, you think of that. Well, that's not what these judges are. When you think of a judge in the book of Judges, think of deliverer. Okay, a judge is a deliverer. In the Hebrew, the word literally means to rule or to lead, to contend, to defend, or to deliver. And so we see this cycle of the Israelites where they would rebel against the Lord, retribution would come, they would repent, and then the Lord would bring restoration. And the way that God would bring restoration is that God would raise up judges, these warriors, these leaders to help deliver the Israelites from bondage. They would get themselves in a mess. They would call their mom and dad, you know, God, forgive us, help us. We're sorry, we didn't mean to do that. We know you're right. And God in his grace and his kindness and his everlasting mercy would raise up a judge and those judges would bring deliverance to the Israelites. Make sense? So that's the book of Judges. A judge was a warrior, not someone that sits behind a mahogany bench with a robe and a gavel. A judge was a deliverer. And in this book, depending on who you ask, you have between 12 and 14 judges who God raises up for his people. Remember, these are real people. These are real times. This is real history. 
And so God would use these judges to deliver the Israelites. From the beginning of Judges to the end covers about 300 to 350 years. It covers a time between the leadership of Joshua and a time where we'll see actually the first king of the Israelites who would be Saul, King Saul. There's quite a contrast between the book of Joshua and the book of Judges. And I put those contrasts in your notes. I'm not going to take the time to go over them, but you can check it out. So let's look at some key events. The first key event that we see is rebellion, unfortunately. And we see this right at the beginning in chapter 1. Look in chapter 1, verse 1. Judges begins with the death of Joshua. After Joshua died, it's interesting that the book of Joshua begins with the same verse, except Moses. Uh, uh, Moses dies at the beginning of Joshua, and now we have um, the book of Judges, and Joshua has died. Two great leaders, two great men of God who had brought the Israelites out of bondage and into the promised land. The Israelites asked the Lord, which tribe should attack the Canaanites first? And the Lord answered Judah, for I have given them victory over the land. Remember, this is so important. God had told the Israelites to go and to take the land, but they were also supposed to do something as a result of them obtaining the land. They were to drive out the current inhabitants of the land. And I know it sounds harsh and I know it sounds horrible because of what the things that they would have to do, but that's just the way it was. And part of the reason why God asked them to do that was because the people that were inhabiting the promised land worshiped false gods and false idols. And God wanted to start this new generation of, of Israelites kind of with a clean slate. He wanted to purge the land of all of its evil and of all of the false gods and bring the Israelites in. Well, we know this, that the Israelites did not take all the land that God had told them to take, nor did they drive out all of the people that were in the land and it would come back to bite them. Matter of fact, a key verse in chapter one is a part of this rebellion we see in verse 19. It says, the Lord was with the people of Judah and they took possession of the hill country. Yes, that's great. That's exactly what God told them to do. But they failed to drive out the people living in the plains who had iron chariots. Or maybe because they had iron chariots, they were scared. Maybe they got lazy. Maybe they got content. You know, this land is good. We'll settle for this. We don't need all of it. But God had told them. And we'll see this common theme throughout this chapter, especially. Look in verse 21 of chapter 1 in the book of Judges. Verse 21 says, The tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to what? Drive out the Jebusites. Skip down to verse 27. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Beth Shan. Look in verse 28. It says the same thing. When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they did not what? Drive them out of the land. Look in verse uh, 30. The tribe of Zebulun, they've also failed to what? Drive out the Canaanites. Look in verse 30 or excuse me, verse 31. The tribe of Asher failed to do what? Drive out the residents. Look at uh, verse 32. In fact, because they did not drive them out, the Canaanites dominated the land where the people of Asher, remember that's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Canaanites dominated the land, not the Israelites. And then look in verse 33. The tribe of Naphtali, also failed to drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh. And so we see this over and over that they did part of what God had wanted them to do, but not all of it. Listen, there's an important lesson in here, and that's this. Partial obedience is not obedience. Partial obedience does not equal obedience. Well, I do part of what God tells me to do in the Bible. Partial obedience is not obedience. And we see this with the Israelites and it would come back to haunt them. 
The second key event that we see in this book is in chapter two, we see selfishness. First they rebel, and then we see nothing but selfishness. The disobedience of the previous generation would bring erosion to their commitment to God. And it had a major impact on this next generation. Remember, God had instruct, instructed them to do what? To take the commandments that the Lord had told them and to pass it on to who? Their children. And then to pass it on to who else? Their children's children. So they were to pass off these distinctives and these laws and these commands to their kids and to their kids' kids. And yet we see in chapter two that this didn't really take place. Look in verse 10. It says, after that generation died, what generation? That generation that had followed the Lord. Another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they did what? They worshiped the images of Baal. This is why God wanted them to drive them out of the land. Because now, instead of the Israelites influencing people, the false worship, the polytheistic culture is influencing God's people. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt, and they chased after other gods. They worshiped the gods of the people around them, and this angered the Lord. You say, well, why would they do this after all that God has done for them? Well, it's much easier to live an undisciplined life than it is to live a disciplined life, right? I mean, we all admit that. It's much easier to do that. And so they got selfish. They got lazy. And they forgot that they were supposed to be distinct. They were supposed to be holy. They abandoned the Lord, verse 13, and served Baal and the images of Ashtaroth. They made the Lord's anger burn against them. And so the Lord handed them over to marauders who stole their possessions. And so we see because of their disobedience, the Lord would allow them to be overtaken by the people that they were supposed to drive out in the first place. And so we see selfishness here. Look in verse 19. In verse 19, he says, but when the judge died, so the Lord would raise up a judge and the judge would deliver him and give them peace. But when the judge died, the people would turn back to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those that had lived before them. They'd follow after other gods, worshiping them and bowing down to them, and they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. And so a leader would die, a judge would die, and they'd go back to their ways. Oh, mom and dad are out of town, so now we can parte, right? And, you know, I tell people this, especially young people, and I know we have middle schoolers and high schoolers and college students that attend and even some young adults, and, 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 and I tell them this all the time, and maybe even adults need to hear this. But at some point in your life, your faith has to become your own. Does that make sense? At some point in your life, you have to say, okay, my faith's important to me. It's not about my dad. It's not about my mom. It's not about my grandparents. Okay, I understand the way that I was raised. Maybe they raised me. But at some point, we have to take faith and grasp it for ourselves and say, this is my faith. I tell my kids this all the time. They're like, oh, my dad's a pastor. My dad, it doesn't matter. That, that means absolutely nothing when it comes to your relationship with God. You don't get into heaven because your dad was a pastor or because your grandparents were missionaries or they did this all over. It doesn't matter. Who is God to you in your life? Is your faith important? And at some point, you have to grasp that and you have to take control and responsibility for your own faith. And you see these Israelites, as soon as a judge, a spiritual leader died off, they just went back to doing their own thing, which meant they didn't really care about their faith. It didn't mean anything to them. They just did it out of religion and out of obedience, not because they were passionate about God. So they go from rebellion, they go to selfishness, and then the third key event is, is, is assimilation. What happens is they end up assimilating with all of the pagan culture around them. They were supposed to drive them out, but they didn't. They assimilated with them, which is a direct violation with what God had told them. The key verse in this chapter is verses five and six. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, 
the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and they intermarried with them. Israelite sons married their daughters and Israelite daughters were given in marriage to their sons and the Israelites served other gods. This became a problem. They were supposed to drive them out. They were supposed to be distinct. But instead, they assimilated with them and worshiped false gods. Now, remember God had told them over and over, and the reason why God had all these dietary laws and ceremonial laws and celebrations and all of the things that God had asked them to do was because the, 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 um, the children of Israel were supposed to be holy which means to be set apart for a specific use. They were not to blend in with the cultures around them, remember? They were to treat people different. They were to live different. They were to act different. But instead, they just assimilated with those around them. The Bible tells us that we're, of this, that, 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 that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. That we're not to allow the world around us to squeeze us into its own mold. We're not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In other words, as believers, as Christians, there should be some distinctives in our lives where we don't blend in with an anti-God culture around us. Does that make sense? And so the Israelites were supposed to be distinctive. They, were, they even had physical differences. They were circumcised. They were supposed to do everything different, and yet they just blend in with the culture around them. And we see this throughout um, their lives, that they assimilated. And here's another thing. Who you hang out with matters. It matters greatly. You know, you're always told that you're going to end up like the five closest people you are in your life. Um, do you hang out with, with, with dreamers? Do you hang out with achievers? Do you hang out with people that love Jesus? And you say, well, aren't we supposed to be salt and light? Like, aren't we supposed to have an influence on, on I mean, if I just hang out with church people all the time, then how am I going to have an influence on, on, on people that don't know the Lord? And you're absolutely right. But what about this? Here's a question. It's not a question of who you hang out. It's a question, who's influencing who? I call it the lean, right? Who's leaning on who, right? If as a believer, you have influences in your life that you're trying to make a difference in their lives, that's amazing. But if they're influencing you to not serve God, to develop habits that you know are not godly or bringing you away from the Lord, then the Bible says those relationships are not to happen. That means we're unequally yoked. We should not be. But if we're influencing others, if we're being a leader and they're leaning on us, that's okay. That's, what was supposed, that's what's supposed to happen. But this wasn't happening with the Israelites. They are in their own land and they're being influenced by the negative pagan culture around them. The next major section or key event that we see is chapters 3 through 16, and this is the majority of the book, where God raises up these judges. We're introduced to several of these judges. Some of them you've heard of. Some of them you probably haven't heard of. You've, you've probably heard of Gideon. You've probably heard of Deborah. At least if you are here last year when we did our series on amazing women in the Bible, we talked about Deborah. You've heard of Samson. You guys have heard of Samson, right? Samson was a judge. And so... In chapters 3 through 16, we're introduced to all of these different judges. And I'm not going to go through and talk about each one. We're going to pull out three at the end of the message and, and, and talk about ways that God had used them. But God would raise up. Some of these judges were good, and they did a really good job. Some of them had dark sides, and they struggled. They were human beings. Um, but God used many of them in great ways. And they were able to experience peace under the rule and the reign of these judges. The last major section or the last key event in chapter 17 through 21, we see chaos, we see corruption, we see civil war. The content in the last few chapters of Judges is rated R. Definitely horrible events take place. 
And there's a reason why. Look in chapter 17 in your Bible in verse 6. Verse 6 says, In those days Israel had no king. So the people did what seemed right in their own eyes. And we see this again. Look in chapter 18. In those days, Israel had no king. Look in chapter 19. In those days, verse 1, Israel had no king. Look in chapter 21. At the very last verse of the book of Judges. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. So the people did whatever seemed right in what? In their own eyes. It didn't matter what God thought. There were no laws, there were no rules, no moral boundaries, no conscience. They just did whatever they wanted to do, whatever they thought was right. And it led to corruption, it led to to bondage, it led to enslavement, because that's what sin does. The wages of sin is death. It doesn't just mean physical death, it could mean death to your dreams, death to your career, Death to your family, it can mean death to a lot of things when we choose our own ways instead of God's ways. You know, if you want to walk into a place of business and just grab as much inventory as you want and run out with a flash mob, it's okay. I mean, you just do whatever's right in your own eyes, right? I mean, if you want to disrespect a teacher at school or cuss a teacher out, I mean, who cares? You just do whatever you want to do. You just do what's right in your own eyes. I mean, if you want to have sex with whatever you want, whoever you want, whenever you want, who cares? There's no moral laws. You just do whatever feels good. Whatever impulses you have in your life, just do whatever you want to do. Because you just do whatever's right in your own eyes. Nobody can tell you what's right or wrong. If you want to disrespect law enforcement or even attack law enforcement, disrespect, it doesn't matter. There are no rules. You just do whatever you want to do. You do whatever you think is right in your own eyes. And this was the culture of the Israelites. They just did whatever they wanted to do, whenever they wanted to do it. Who cares what God thinks? Who is God to tell me what I can and cannot do? I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Chapters 19 through 21 are probably some of the worst chapters in the entire Bible. Very R-rated. Very difficult to read. I'm not going to go over it this morning. You can read it at home if you like that kind of stuff. It's dark. It's horrible. And it's one of the worst sections of Scripture in the entire Bible. And it just tells you how depraved the culture had gotten at that point. Thank God, next week, we're going to have a flower in the desert. Because in the midst of this environment, you have this incredible story of a woman named Ruth. Beautiful story. So let's wrap things up with ordinary people, with extraordinary stories. We're going to talk about three people quickly this morning that were ordinary people that God used in extraordinary ways. I've told you guys, don't forget, these are real people. These are real events. This stuff really happened. And these people that we're going to talk about, these three judges were ordinary. They are just like you and I. And yet they were available to God. They were sold out to God in a corrupt culture. They stood out even though they had flaws and they made mistakes, but yet God used them in incredible ways. The first person we're going to look at is Deborah, chapters 4 and 5. Her story is amazing. She goes from a wife to a warrior. Remember, judges were warriors. And Deborah is the first and only female judge in the history of Israel. And her story of leadership and courage and commitment to God is truly inspiring. Deborah was very unique because she was one of only two people in the entire Bible that was both a judge and a prophet. A prophet is somebody that hears from God directly and then relays that message to God's people. There are only two in the entire Bible, and that's Samuel And Deborah, she was both a prophet and she was a judge. I know there's a lot of debate 
especially the last few years, but there always has been between denominations and on the role of women in the local church. And I've never been a fan, and we don't have to agree. It's okay to disagree, okay? So everybody take a deep breath. It's okay to disagree, okay? It's okay, okay? I personally, I've never been a fan of just only male-dominated churches, um, some churches can be very misogynistic. And, um, and yet in the Bible, we see God using women in incredible ways. And you say, well, Deborah wasn't a pastor. Really? These judges were spiritual leaders. They were warriors, but they were also, remember, they, they, they were to help God's people repent. They were looked up to as spiritual leaders. And yet God uses a woman in a time where women had very few rights and in a geographical location where women to this day still have very few rights. And yet God uses this woman, Deborah, to be both a prophet and a judge to help deliver God's people. We see throughout God's word that there are prophetesses throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, women played a big role in the ministry of Jesus and in the ministry of Paul, Paul planted churches. And in many of those churches, they were hosted and even led by in homes with women leaders. Matter of fact, in the, New in the New Testament, where the Bible talks about spiritual gifts, the Bible doesn't say, well, these are the gifts that are only for men. And these are the spiritual gifts that are only for women. The Bible says these are spiritual gifts Everybody has a spiritual gift and everybody has a responsibility to use those spiritual gifts for the Lord. And I'll tell you what, I am grateful that New Hope has a rich history of, of promoting and, 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 and I don't want to use the word allow, but on having women in leadership. I think it's a blessing. It's awesome. Matter of fact, I know who does what around here. And if it wasn't for incredible women that we have at this church that lead prayer ministries, that lead life groups, that lead kids ministry stuff, that lead teens, that help or that lead parts of Spanish ministry, that lead all different parts. If we did not have the incredible women leaders here at New Hope, we would not be able to function on a daily basis. Definitely not on Sundays. Seriously. We have some incredible women leaders. Deborah is a mother. Deborah is a wife. Matter of fact, we're told in chapter four that she's a wife. And yet she's this incredible warrior. Turn back to chapter four. Judges chapter four. Look in verse 23. So God has raised her up to deliver God's people. And she has a, this is how respected um, Deborah was. Look in verse six. She has this commander of her army named Barak. And in verse six, God tells them, or actually she says, the Lord had said to her, this is what the Lord has commanded Israel. And the reason why the Lord had commanded Israel, because God spoke to Deborah. Deborah's a prophet. God spoke to her and then she spoke to the people. You're to assemble 10,000 warriors from the chi tribes of Naf Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will lure Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors. She's not afraid of the char chariots. To the Kishon River, and there I will give victory over him. And Barak, her commander in her, in her army, said, I will go, but only if you go with me. The commander of the army of Israel says, I'll go, but Deborah, you need to go with me. Why? One, she was a great warrior. Two, she heard directly from God. She was a spiritual leader and he didn't want to go to war without her. She led Israel to a great victory. Deborah was an ordinary woman, a mom, a wife who God used in extraordinary ways. If God can use Deborah, God can use you. 
There are no excuses. Well, I'm a woman, I'm a girl, I'm a mother, I'm a wife. God used her to do incredible things. The next person that we're going to look at is Gideon. And I'm going to summarize these because we're running out of time. They're in your notes. Gideon, we see from chapter 6 to chapter 8. Gideon goes from the least of his family to a great leader. Matter of fact, when God called Gideon, Gideon didn't believe God. (laughs) Gideon is like, God calls him a great warrior. They had been overtaken by the Philistines. Gideon, his family are hiding in like the lower parts, kind of down in these caves. And he's, uh, and he's harvesting wheat kind of down in the valley when you'd usually harvest wheat up on a hill, but they're hiding. And, and God comes to Gideon and he says, great warrior. And Gideon's like, Read it. Are you, talk, are you talking to me? <laughs> right? He's like, you're, you're, who is a great warrior? Gideon's like, not me. My family, we're in bondage and we're the least family of our tribe. And I am the least of my entire family. Gideon's like, there's no way you could use me, God. No way. And Gideon's like, okay, God, And this isn't, I don't think Gideon is questioning God. I think Gideon's questioning himself. Is this really from God? Gideon says, okay, God, if you really think you can use me, even though I'm the least of all my family, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to put out a fleece, which would have been like a piece of clothing or a piece of material. And if this is really from you, I want you, when I wake up in the morning, I want this fleece to be sopped soaking wet. I want it to be sopping with water, but I want the land all around it to be dry. So Gideon wakes up and lo and behold, the fleece is wet and everything around it's dry. Gideon's like, okay, I still don't know that you can really use me, God. So this is what I want you to do, please. And this is how gracious God is and how the, God wanted to build his confidence. He said, okay, now I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to put the fleece out. This time I want the fleece to be completely dry when I wake up and the land and the territory all around it to be wet. And so he goes to bed and he wakes up and he's like, dang, I guess now God's got to do something through me. (laughs) Listen, Gideon would end up becoming this great leader. He had flaws, no doubt. And we see a dark side to Gideon, but Gideon ends up delivering God's people. And he gives Israel 40 years of peace under Gideon's leadership. And if God can use Gideon, who had no confidence, who was the least in his family, God can use you in extraordinary ways. And lastly, Samson. We all know the story of Samson. But Samson's story is more of a reverse. Because Samson goes from extraordinary to ordinary. Let me summarize Samson's life really really quickly. You can read it, um, what is it, Judges chapter 13 through 16. Samson's birth is announced by angels. His mother is barren. The Philistines are reaping havoc on the Israelites. They've been in bondage longer at this time than any other time while they've been in the land. And God raises up this man named Samson. Samson was supposed to be set apart. He was to be a Nazarite, which was a, it was usually just a temporary vow where you focus on God and and, and God did a, you know, you really were committed to God for a specific amount of time. There's usually a beginning and an end, but Samson was to be a Nazarite for life. And we know Samson, he's known for what? His long hair, his muscles, his strength, all of that. But here's the deal with Samson. God had gifted him, he's the opposite of Gideon. God had gifted him in unbelievable ways. Samson was brilliant, he was strong, he was focused, he had incredible drive. However, Samson was never really interested in God. This man whose birth had been announced by angels and who God was going to raise up to be the greatest deliverer in the history of his people, Samson never really cared about God's plan. Samson filled his life with whatever he wanted to do. You know when the first words, recorded words out of Samson's mouth are, I saw a woman, 
he was going to be in deep trouble. (laughs) And Samson spent his entire life not really caring about God's plan. God cared far more about Samson than Samson cared about God. As a matter of fact, a little bit later in Samson's life, his people end up delivering him to the Philistines. They were better off without him. He was, because of his choices and his decisions, he was causing his people to be harmed in greater ways. And his people came to a point where they found him and they gave him over to the enemy because they were better off without him. What a tragic story. And then you know the end of Samson's life. His eyes are gouged out, which there's a lot of symbolism there. And he ends up bringing down these pillars and he killed more people in his death than he did in his life and ends up killing himself. A tragic story. And I think about us because some of you have been gifted in incredible ways. God has gifted you with so many gifts. Some people are so gifted, I'm like, it's just not fair. (laughs) And yet, are you using those gifts for the glory of God? Are you using those gifts for the calling that God has on your life? Then there's some of you that say, well, I don't have any gifts at all, so God can't use me. I, I, no, that's not an excuse. Gideon was the least of everything, and yet God used him to be an amazing leader. I told you it's more about availability than it is ability. And God wants to use every one of you to do great things, to do extraordinary things in your family, in your neighborhood, in your job, and wherever God has placed you. God wants to do amazing and extraordinary things through you. But the choice is ours. Are we going to submit to those or are we going to just accomplish our own purposes? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the lessons that we see in the book of Judges. Some of them are inspiring lessons and some of them are are lessons that we're to avoid. And so God, I just pray for each person here this morning. Lord, there is so much potential in every single person here. So much potential. And yet so many times we use so many excuses. Well, I'm only a mother or I'm a single mother or I'm only this and God can't do this or, you know, I made mistakes in my past and I used to be addicted and I used to be, I mean, I, I, maybe I spent time in jail and I did this and I did that. And yet we use all these excuses for why God can't use us and yet God is greater than any of those. And then there are some of us here that have unbelievable gifts and we're only using our gifts for our own self-gratification. And yet our gifts are to be used to bring you glory and to make a difference in the lives of other people. So God, I pray that whatever end of the spectrum we're on, I pray that you just speak to each person. However appropriately that you want to speak to them and help us to listen to your word. There's potential in every single person here. There's greatness in every single person here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in to New Hope this week. You know, the church doesn't stop when the video does. And make sure that you share this with a friend. You can even support what we're doing via the Give button here on the left. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single Sunday. And we cannot wait to see you this week, either in person or online. Have a great day.